When civilization began in the Middle East, low population densities and the easy proximity of city and countryside, each easily within walking distance of the other, made urban pollution manageable. There wasn't any plastic, there were few toxic chemicals, and the ancients knew well how filth could be easily transformed into fertility to create a true revolution in food production. With ever larger densities of people who usually moved into or next to the new cities with their animals, closing the cycle to grow more plants and feed ever more animals and people was easy. Cities started out by creating abundance rather than problems. With all the non-eaten food wastes available and all the nutrient-rich wastes from digested food, read manures and toilet wastes, the city and its immediate environment actually became some of the richest places on earth. People today don't think about city garbage as something good, but not so long ago both food waste and night soil, a euphemism for toilet wastes, were collected from urban centers and carted out to surrounding farms and fields. And in the Middle East in the past, as in certain quarters today, like the Zabaline trash recycling community of Cairo, where I did my PhD research, animals lived with people in the city, because that's the easiest place to find food for them. Unlike the situation in other poor areas in the world, among the Zabaline I always was able to eat meat. Also, a substantial amount of food plants was grown in cities, a practice that kept many alive in walled cities like Jerusalem during sieges. And history records the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, where huge trees were said to bear fruit as abundantly as if they were growing in their natural environments. That's a quote. The city, after all, is where the solar energy and nutrients and irrigation water found in food grown on farms ends up, and there's plenty of gray water available. No wonder that so many animals chose domestication. No wonder that humans decided to become civilized after nearly 70,000 years as hunter-gatherer nomads. City life created abundance rather than... City life created abundance greater than any life form had seen in the history of the earth, particularly in desert areas. And it's because the city is such an exciting historical oddity that I became an urban planner, working as an Arab American on urban ecology issues in the Middle East and North Africa, where much of what we call civilization began. Of course, the sheer availability of stored solar energy and water and nutrition found in urban kitchen, bath, and toilet wastes didn't always attract the best citizens, especially when it wasn't properly recycled. Where people ignored the lessons of nexus thinking and allowed the right materials to accumulate at the wrong concentration at the wrong time in the wrong place, other organisms that could see or sense their potential for their use in the Darwinian struggle became a problem. Forest animals like rats discovered the urban cornucopia was far richer than anything they could find in the countryside, and the results were nothing like we see in the Disney film Ratatouille. Instead, it led to tragedies like the bubonic plague, microbes that had been kept in check in more complex ecosystems like E. coli and cholera and typhoid were able to proliferate in the nutrient-dense but biodiversity-poor urban environments. But instead of trying to understand the simple ecology of biological waste transformation and trying to design our growing cities to work well with nature, we declared war on the harmful organisms who proliferated in our urban environments. And once ecosystem services were damaged in this war, which was waged without regard for the beneficial organisms, we created a downward spiral into what is called a low-level equilibrium trap that sometimes seems very difficult to get out of. The results were the development of a concrete jungle and a culture that made organic waste something to sterilize or flush away or bury as quickly as possible rather than use to green the city. This attempt to put organic wastes out of sight, out of mind, and ignore the solutions suggested by the food energy water nexus approach was a mistake that we are still paying for. Fortunately, there is a new green urbanism that understands what Bill Clinton said to me when I made a commitment to action with him and the, global, and the Clinton Global Initiative this October to solve the problem of organic waste in the Zaatari refugee camp in Jordan, a camp so large it is often called Jordan's second largest informal city, a place where nearly 80,000 people fleeing violence in Syria and Iraq live in makeshift tents and housing with no formal sanitation service and where food wastes and toilet wastes are huge problems. 
the former U.S. president put his arm around my shoulder and said, Thomas, you know there's treasure in that there garbage. Let's do this. The do this, to do this thing that the president was talking about, we have to do two of what National Geographic recently called, quote, the five changes major Middle Eastern cities need to make to become more sustainable. And this applies to all cities around the world. That is, we must turn the food waste and toilet waste problems into major solutions by transforming all organic residuals into fuel and fertilizer within the city. The third change would be to use that fuel to power significant portions of the city. And the fourth is to use the fertilizer to grow food in the city through vertical urban farming. The fifth is then to keep all inorganic waste in the city as process inputs for a closed loop industrial ecology solution. Now the good thing is that in many places in the Middle East, this is already beginning to be done, something that became apparent when I was keynote speaker at the International Alternative Fuels Conference in Kayseri, Turkey, December 2nd through 4th of this year. My own work is focused on transferring do-it-yourself and commercial Indian, Chinese, and Israeli home and community scale urban biodigestion technology to poor communities in Egypt and Palestine. My NGO, Solar Cities, has been teaching people how to transform their wastes through home biogas systems that completely eliminate wastes, allowing vertical rooftop farming and guarantee approximately two to three hours of cooking gas from every bucket of food waste they have. Egyptian Environment Minister Leila Skander, whom I worked with in the Zabaline Recycling School years ago, is providing subsidies now to families who implement community biodigesters. And scientists and policymakers from Sudan to Saudi Arabia to Turkey are exploring the cradle-to-cradle -cradle model of industrial ecology. On a larger scale, when I visited the cutting-edge Mazdar City in the United Arab Emirates with a team from National Geographic, we learned that Mazdar is leading the region in the Waste to Energy Initiative. An article in the national UAE newspaper said that the city of Abu Dhabi produces a million tons of municipal waste a year, so much that if it was all put in a landfill, the landfill would equal the size of the city itself in one generation. However, the article said, quote, biological conversion of organic fractions of waste has great potential to produce renewable fuels and biochemicals. It also has a valuable byproduct, a nutrient-rich residue that can be used as fertilizer or compost in combating desertification by putting nutrients back into the UAE's farmlands." End quote. On a small scale or a large scale, the truth is that doing this is actually easy and cost-effective, and it is something that humanity has understood since history began. It's time we went back to get to the future. The Middle East, with its rich history as the cradle of civilization, may be the best place to lead the way. Because my not-for-profit organization, Solar Cities, believes that food waste is the most accessible, uni universally available form of stored solar energy that can be readily transformed into useful commodities like biochemicals and energy and fertilizer, and that the Middle East is a great place to engage in this work, we began implementation of the small-scale biodigestion solution in Jordan with the Clinton Global Initiative this January of 2017. Angela Farhan al Fayez, a Bedouin Jordanian graduate student at the Patel College, and Inas Abdul Rahman, a Palestinian graduate student studying environmental technology in Israel, and I traveled from the Araba Institute at Kibbutz Keturah in southern Israel, where we had built two salchicha or sausage biodigesters in 2001 with home biogas founder Yair Teller, and we carried them across the Allenby Bridge or King Hussein Bridge border, carrying two home biogas commercial family scale domestic digesters to introduce them to Jordan. These biodigesters come unassembled in a box small enough to fit in a taxi and are like the IKEA furniture version of biogas systems. They're part of a worldwide effort to make the systems that transform food wastes into fuel and fertilizer home appliances just like washing machines and refrigerators and water heaters and backyard composters. In fact, they are a form of backyard compost system and are referred to as liquid composters because rather than using air to decompose the organic waste, 
They simply immerse organic garbage in water, without air, and let microbes, obtained through inoculation with any animal manure, even lake mud, do the composting. The systems are safe and easy to use at home. You just scrape your plate or throw the food residuals in the front and you get high quality liquid fertilizer from the back and up to three hours of cooking gas per day from one bucket of food scraps. The gas is stored in a balloon above the flexible plastic digester bag which gets enough pressure to cook with from sandbags placed on top. It's quite simple. My Solar City's colleague Inas Abdurrahman and I were able to take two home biogas systems with us on the bus across the Jordanian border to meet USF student Angelo Fayez. And after conducting an hour-long interview with the border authorities, which we turned into an impromptu workshop for the customs guards, they allowed us to bring them into the country. For the record, they only did so this time after sending our colleague, Mohamed Attia, who owns the permaculture training farm where we're teaching these technologies, all the way to Amman, an hour and a half away, to get a stamp of approval from the Ministry of Energy. They also charged us a 40% import tax, but told us that in the future, if we can get approval from the Prime Minister's office showing the importance of this simple technology for sustainable development, future shipments should be tax exempt. Now, while I was unhappy to have to shell out so much money to get our initiative started, I know that this is the CODB, or the cost of doing business. In new initiatives where people are unfamiliar or skeptical about a technology or an idea, somebody has to assume the risks and the costs and endure the skepticism and even derision to get people to recognize the inherent value in the Nexus approach. And for rather vexing reasons, this particularly central Nexus technology for the transformation of food waste into value-adding products is still a relatively unknown or misunderstood process. People who champion this Nexus solution are still far to the left of Roger's curve describing the diffusion of innovations. A brief reconsideration of Maloney's 16% rule, mapped onto Roger's innovation diffusion curve, shows us where we need to get to. A place past the tipping point, where closing the cycle from food waste to food is simply something everybody does, a kind of sin qua non, without which not. Unfortunately, we see on the left of the chasm that the driver for adoption of a given idea or technology, like small-scale urban biodigesters, for example, is based on scarcity. And in this paradigm, innovators and early adopters are often sadly motivated by feeling special, by being the first kids on the block to have an innovation. They often tromp around calling themselves wizards worthy of Hogwarts magic school, while the rest of the population generally conservative, skeptical spectators or inactives, are haughtily considered by the early adopters to be mere muggles. With this kind of polarization, it is no wonder that it is hard to cross the chasm. But Nexus thinking sees us all as visionaries in some way or another, each of us merely seeing a different and important reality along a different axis of importance and priority. In Nexus thinking, all perspectives need consideration and most have value. They just need to be integrated, as in that metaphor about the blind men and the elephant. Our journey to maximize the common good along many axes relies on us creating social proof as the motivator rather than scarcity, so that everyone can see the benefits of crossing the tipping point into a new paradigm. And that's how paradigm shifts happen. At some point, the majority, the mass of people, have to find it almost inconceivable that anybody would not transform their organic wastes in the city, both from food waste and toilet waste, in situ into high-value food and fertilizer and, once again, new food. Instead of feeling special because we're the few that do this, we need to feel that there's actually something strange, odd, wrong with anyone who doesn't do this. This way, instead of being the few, we become the many in the few nexus. But getting there is a psychological, marketing, socio-political process. It requires emotional intelligence, or EQ, as well as IQ, and technocratic skills. So what we learn from this is that Nexus thinking must include the proper social and political preparations, even when a technology is undeniably simple, effective, and, ex and inexpensive. The social and political dimensions rival economic considerations in their weight, and must be thought through. Those of us who consider ourselves innovators, early adopters, technologists, visionaries, and creators in the food, energy, water, nexus domain 
must be prepared to invest considerable time and energy in helping others see all the benefits that we see in each relevant dimension. In my own work, I've learned the value of having faith and holding vision and in making investments with extremely long-term payback horizons. I've realized that my personal ROI, or return on investment, must include various other forms of capital besides financial. By being willing to earn social capital, intellectual capital, and cultural capital through my work, and seeing how I can accumulate or regenerate natural capital, I offset the loss in financial capital. I start with the premise that all forms of capital are fungible, and that this too is a nexus concept. Just as energy is matter times the speed of light squared, and just as these natural qualities can neither be created or destroyed, but merely transformed, Nexus thinking teaches me to look at multidimensional ways to create value. We in the NGO Solar Cities have been teaching people how to build their own handmade biodigesters in the Middle East since 2009, starting in Cairo, Egypt and Beit Sahur, Palestine near Bethlehem, with simple floating drum digesters made from two water tanks, as I learned to do in India. These are most famously known as the Appropriate Rural Technology Institute, or ARTI RT design, and with our own Solar Cities design that uses intermediate bulk container, or IBC tanks, all made out of local materials. We champion low-cost open source do-it-yourself designs made as much as possible out of local recycled and found materials because we want to eliminate barriers to entry and accelerate diffusion not just of the technologies but the underlying STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math principles underlying the innovation. We do this because we want to help create a culture club that sees eliminating wastes and turning them into clean energy and clean water and healthy food as the new normal at every scale, regardless of income level or education level. We also feel it is important to have we also feel it is important to have professional factory-made commercial systems as part of our efforts, because the average citizen, let's face it, isn't very likely to put in the time or the effort to make or maintain their own system. Also, with any insufficiently understood system, if they are constructed wrong, they may leak or not function properly, leading to abandonment of the system and rejection of the very concept of household and community scale biodigestion and biogas. It certainly can't hurt you. I mean, you could singe your eyebrows. But we have learned that to get this vital solution beyond the early adopter stage, we need that social proof to be incontrovertible. The interesting and perhaps disturbing thing about these food and toilet waste transformation technologies and techniques and their application is once again that there really isn't anything new about them. And they were being done in many locations around the world for many hundreds of years. It could have solved all the pollution and disease problems caused by organic wastes since the beginning of civilization. One of our students in the very first Navigating the Few Nexus course at the Patel College of Sustainability at USF, Tampa, Yi Long Wang, reflected on our first class lecture and wrote to the class, in the video of Few Nexus episode, Professor Thomas H. Culhane said, waste is simply the right thing in a wrong place, a wrong time, or a wrong concentration. I resonated with this because in my country, China, there were always a lot of ways to contribute waste as a resource to another system. For example, I was told that the water we use for cleaning raw rice can be used for watering potted or home planted food, and my mother did that for a long time when she was planting peppers and caraway. However, with rapid development, she does not do it anymore because in our modern life we do not have to consider to save water since we have no worries about water bills. It is sad that recycling is actually decreasing in China at a time when we have exceeded our resources. Another example of implementing waste as a resource happens in my grandparents' home. My grandparents, she said, live in the country. They have a yard which surrounds their house. Different vegetables and trees are planted in the yard so that the vegetables and fruits can always satisfy them. The beauty of their yard is that they never apply chemical fertilizers and pesticides to the plants since there is an unflushing or composting toilet in the yard. In a modern city, excrement is taken as waste and it is flushed after mixing with drinking quality water, which causes water to become disease, causing black water. However, in my grandparents' home, excrement is collected for fertilizing the plants. 
end quote. Another Chinese student in the class, Huan Wang, wrote, There are many examples in my life. In China, many farmers will take food waste and bury it in digesters. After a certain period of fermentation, the digesters will produce methane gas that is released through microbial action. Methane gas is used for cooking or heating water. This is what I know about food and energy nexus from my life in China. End quote. Our Chinese students know all about it. And in fact, this nexus solution has been going on for so long in China that Marco Polo commented upon it when he returned along the Silk Road to Europe from the Orient in the 1300s. So what happened? Well, we could talk about the era of cheap oil and of perverse energy, water, and food production subsidies causing severe market distortions. That is certainly true. We know that almost all of the technologies considered cutting edge by the sustainability and eco-conscious crowds today are also really old. For example, many effective sustainable irrigation and water pumping techniques that are on the table today have been known since the ancient Egyptian Shadouf from 2,000 years ago. Water filtration and purification technologies were also recorded 2,000 years ago. The ram pump, so popular among eco-villagers today, was invented and used in 1796. Solar electricity was discovered in 1839 by Becquerel in France. The first solar cells were produced in 1888, and Einstein described how the photoelectric effect works in a 1905 paper and got his Nobel Prize for it in 1922. So we really understood that. Solar hot water systems have been known for millennia, and parabolic concentrating solar dishes were commercially produced on an industrial scale and used to pump water and create electricity in Egypt in the early 1900s. And solar hot water systems were sold at a home scale in Florida and California in the early 1920s. Fuel cells, such as NASA uses on the space station and are used in hydrogen cars, were invented in 1839 by Sir William Grove. Stirling engines, aka heat engines, were invented in 1816. Wind generators for electricity first appeared in Scotland and the U.S. in 1887, and there were thousands across America up until the Highway Act of the 1950s when they were taken down and actually destroyed. Electric cars have been around since the 1830s, and Thomas Edison began mass producing them with Henry Ford and the Ford Edison Electric Car Company in 1914 until their factory was sabotaged. Edison even had perfected a long-lasting, reliable, non-toxic nickel-iron battery system for renewable energy technologies, and he championed the ideas of decentralized off-grid energy production coupled with food production on farms across America. Edison was a nexus thinker. And nexus thinking permeated most of the early inventors and tinkerers. Of course, as we've pointed out, biodigesters and vertical farming apparently go back to the time of the ancient Persians and Babylonians and are arguably the oldest, simplest, and most practical of all the few nexus technologies we know, since they could always have been built out of local materials and never relied on electricity, dynamos, copper wires, magnets, semiconductors, glass, metal, or plastic. We can use these materials to make them today and improve them, but they could be made with everything that we've had all along for thousands of years. You would think they would be unstoppable because they not only supply valuable services, but solve dire problems as well. And yet, all of these ideas and technologies seem to have died in the modern era. And yet, all of these ideas and technologies seem to have died at some point in the modern era or have been vigorously resisted. So who killed the electric car and the solar energy systems and the biodigesters and the urban food production systems? Who made us turn toward unsustainable paths? Was it some vast conspiracy of the oil companies and petro dictators and champions of planned obsolescence oriented capitalist economies? Well, in part, we can say yes. But as the famous Pogo cartoon states, we've met the enemy and he is us. Why? Because in our school systems and homes, we stopped teaching nexus thinking. We stopped thinking in a nexus way. It's as if we collectively caught some feverish disease of tunnel vision, preferring to analyze only instead of striving to synthesize what our analysis and reductionism had revealed. We took Humpty Dumpty apart 
and didn't invest the time in teaching our children how to put him back together again. We got lazy and gave in to a rule of experts and specialists that eroded our common sense. Personally, I blame the schools. For generations, for some 15 years of our lives, we've allowed ourselves to be herded into classrooms like cattle, where authority figures who cared more about discipline than discovery talked at us, dumbing us down in the system's desire to mass manufacture Joe and Sally citizen. We rarely tasted or glimpsed the huge multi-dimensional benefits of Nexus thinking and its applications. But we can recover from this because Nexus thinking is natural. Remember that. Nexus is natural. Our brains are Nexus machines, sensing, synthesizing, perceiving patterns, and inventing new combinations. And nature is a Nexus ecosystem, an ecology. And whether made up of non-human or of industrial ecology systems, nature is always a web of Nexus possibilities interconnecting. I believe that when we human beings are allowed to explore these interconnections for ourselves in the real world, we naturally turn into good Nexus thinkers. So if we want to become true Nexus practitioners and save civilization, I advocate going back to the most accessible and original technology for reconnecting the Nexus between food, energy, and water. I advocate looking at the wastes we all produce in our homes and villages and towns and cities wastes that currently contaminate our water and air and soil, and take personal responsibility for turning them back into clean water and air and healthy soil and new food in the never-ending cycle. I advocate doing it at home and in our communities as an activity we can all engage in on a personal level, a level that embeds and encodes Nexus thinking into our daily lives in an inescapable manner. I advocate reclaiming food waste in the city as the easiest starting point for Nexus thinking, and that we follow that path as it blossoms out into every other aspect of the Nexus until we truly eliminate the very concept of waste. And from that waste-free vantage point, when our cities and countrysides are so clean and resources so efficiently used, look again at all the other technologies we have now and have had for so long, simple, complex, traditional, and exotic, and see how then to fit them into the reconceived nexus puzzle. My own belief is that once we take care of all of our so-called organic wastes or organic residuals, once we take care of our own SHIT, so to speak, the rest will be rather easy, and we can create and live in truly sustainable cities and thereby truly save civilization, and at the same time, bring back all the wilderness and wild creatures that we've needlessly sacrificed in its creation. For in the Nexus, not only need there be no waste, but no extinctions either, and hence no collapse of civilizations or life support systems or ecosystems. In the Nexus, we thrive.